Coming up in this week in computer hardware, Magic Leap has a ship date, kind of. MacBook Pro owners get the CPU updates they deserve. AMD Ryzen 2500, 2600, and 2700 leaks. And how about that Motorola Moto G6? All that and more are coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 474, recorded on July 12, 2018. It's transformative. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Stop crime before it happens and help make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Go to ring.com slash twitch and get up to $150 off a ring of security kit. Welcome to Twitch this week in computer hardware. Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most elegant, the most delightful, the most surreal, and the most peculiar hardware news available in the known or unknown universe. Today, a story from small town Florence, Kentucky, where ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ryan Shroud is to be found contemplating the future of autonomous vehicles. I'm kidding, man. Hey, Ryan, I'm Patrick Norton. <laughs> uh, I have no story for anybody. Um, I, was try I, was I was trying to brainstorm very quickly about a story I could tell you in about 12 seconds, but instead you got 12 seconds of me telling you that I had no such, no such story for the lead-in. Yeah. Were you surprised that, that Ford's going, you know, all Ford, well, one, Ford's walking away from uh, cars. Um, right. And uh, they are actually going. They are working, going uh, uh, electric. That kind of blew my mind. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's doing a, it's sort a, of electric trucks. It's it's a pretty drastic move to to get rid of. Say, I mean, in a fairly short time frame, we're going to stop selling cars, with the exception of you know the Mustang and one other car, right. right? But keep our SUVs and keep our trucks. That's what's selling. That's that's uh, uh, a, a drastic swing. Um, well, they're going to keep the Mustangs. <laughs> right, right. And I think there was one, there was like um, one of the smaller cars as well. Maybe that was just in Europe they were going to keep or something like that. But yeah. well, in the, the U.S., the move it's to electric trucks, SUVs, and Mustangs. That's the U.S. So, okay, okay. The move to electric, yeah. though, you're saying. The, the move to electric is also pretty quick sounding based on their timeline. Um, but, it, you know, stuff like the 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 electric Ford F-150 or what have you, that's got to be a supplemental power system. Um, they're not going to be able to get rid of the the gas engines for that. Torque is great to get you moving, but if you want to continue moving, um, you know, if you're towing a trailer full of stuff or oh. uh, a camper or what have you, you know, be nice to be able on to continue hand, to do I, that. On one hand, I hear you, but as somebody who, who drives a diesel truck with 400 foot-pounds of torque and uh, 160 horsepower, um, there is something to be said for appropriate gearing and having six or eight-speed transmissions. But um, I just thought it was crazy. Because you don't right have there. range issues. I don't have range issues, but that's what's – I mean, I am, I am curious to see what they can do because you can stuff a lot of batteries. You know, you, you take an 1,100-pound – you know, diesel engine out of the front of the truck, you can put in, you know, a two, 300 pound electric motor and, and several hundred pounds of batteries. I'm really, I, for me, I'm curious is, is to see what they can do in terms of, uh, you know, next generation lithium ion batteries. If maybe they purchased a patent, they think that it's going to give them an advantage. I'm, I'm really curious because yeah, I mean, I can, I can pretty, if I do things right, maybe not with a trailer, I can get an 800 mile range out of my truck. Um, right. you know, in terms of, uh, let me double check the math, but you know, leaving a comfortable, leaving a comfortable couple of gallons in the tank. So I don't run out of gas. I should be good for like 450 miles towing a trailer on my truck and still have like 30 yeah. miles in reserve. But uh, I just thought it was crazy to think of Ford, like a, like not doing cars, uh, except for the Mustang and B um, they're talking about 40 electrified vehicles 16 of which will be EVs by 2022. So you're probably right. They're probably starting out with, with assistance. Um, for me, what's, what's always fascinating about electric vehicles, which is something you know intimately because uh, you've been driving them every freaking day of your life for several years, um, you know, is 
the flat the the torque curve is just flat from zero yep. RPM to maximum RPM, which uh, for people who uh, you know if, if people expect electric cars to be wimpy, but when you have several hundred foot pounds of torque as soon as you touch the pedal, um, mayhem can happen really quickly if you're not prepared yep. for it. Uh, yep. You know. Not so much with with modern computer controlled, uh, you know, or traction control equipped vehicles. But sorry, that just kind of that just kind of blew my mind. Um, <laughs> I'm really, I'm I'll be curious. I'll be curious to see what the hybrid F series trucks looks like, and uh, if they can do sort of an all. I w- it would be interesting to see an all electric crossover. You know, like a small all wheel drive vehicle with 300 miles of range. Um, we wait with bated breath, or maybe not. Uh, Apple updated the 13 and 15-inch <laughs> MacBook Pros, touch bars, uh, the latest Intel CPUs, more RAM, True Tone displays, uh, more storage, and oddly enough, uh, notes the Verge, quieter keyboards. Um, I I was kind of curious plus. about that. Yeah, uh, and uh, I, I like uh, uh, Mr. Dieter Bond's uh, subhead on that article, slightly more than just spec bumps. <laughs> <laughs> It was kind of interesting that they they released it this way. There was just basically a uh, like a press release announcement on their site. Right. Uh, I'm sure they sent it out to the media and whatnot, but no no events, nothing like that. Um, updated some devices, but not others. Like the 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 MacBook with the with the uh, uh, touch display or the, um, mm-hmm. the what's that? I just blanked on this that strip. En- well, the entry level 13 inch MacBook Pro um, is not getting. Uh, an update, um, right? But the, and that's the, the only one that oh, has physical function keys. Worth <laughs> noting. <laughs> Quote, which the community is taken to calling the MacBook Escape because it has a real escape key. Um, <laughs> I like that. That's good. To give you an idea of how far behind the processors were on the MacBook Pros, uh, you know, Apple was saying that uh, you're looking at a 70% bump in performance on the 15-inch model, and you should uh, get a 100%, a doubling of speed on the 13-inch model. Mm. Think about okay. that for a second. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing yeah. uncomfortably because, uh, <laughs> you know, these are not inexpensive machines. Right. Um, and if you bought one last month, how pissed off are you going to be? Um you know, this True. is these are these are huge bumps in specs. And you know, one of my running jokes uh, when I was doing a lot of five hundred dollar PC builds, I still love building five hundred dollar PCs. But my running jokes: if you build a five hundred dollar PC and you can keep using it with sort of incremental upgrades to the GPU or adding some more memory, or or uh, you know, one of the big ones was when SSDs became affordable. Um, you know, by the time you, you start with a five hundred dollar PC, which has sort of an entry level processor. You know, in three or four years, when you go to you know build a new machine, you're getting what feels like an absolutely mind blowing increase in performance. But you know, these are like you know the entry yeah. level on these notebooks is fifteen hundred, eighteen hundred bucks, and they were way behind on CPUs. So if you've been waiting out to buy a new MacBook Pro, uh, you're a happy camper right now. Um, Thirty two gigs of uh, DDR four memory on the fifteen inch MacBook, uh, which is pretty awesome. If you have the money, you can get like a four terabyte SSD inside of that. Um, mm. The uh, up to two terabytes of storage inside of the thirteen inch model. Um, this is pretty cool, I think. They uh, so the the core i nine. So you get six core processors in that. I agree, that's pretty great. Um, you also. Up to four terabytes of storage is fantastic to be able to get that in the mobile device, but uh, right. it's not inexpensive no. because uh, I think they're charging a thousand dollars per terabyte on that upgrade path, right? So they're <laughs> they're charging you a dollar a gig for NVMe storage, um, which is a you know more than double what you should be paying. Right. Uh, I would argue for that, but. Not, not again. Not an unexpected result based on on who we're talking about. I guess. Um, <laughs> I, I do think the like the. I'm I'm very curious to see what the differences are in the keyboard. Uh, if they are addressing, surely they're addressing the mechanical issues that they've had uh, with right. the current generations of keyboards. They've they noted that they're quieter. I'm a big fan of that uh, mm-hmm. across the board as well. The T2 chip, the the new kind of uh, processor that. Uh, was available in the iMac Pro, 
is now in the MacBook Pros uh, that uh, supports the the Siri functionality uh, on that too. So now that moves from just an iMac feature to a MacBook feature. Right. So if you happen to care about using that on your laptop, now you have that capability. I I've never seen anybody do it yet, but I'm sure there are some of us out. Sure, who like talking are. to their computers. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I mean to put it in context, when you're looking at a uh, NVMe, like a two terabyte uh, NVMe drive, you're looking at in the, in the M.2 format, and I don't know what the uh, the format of the drive inside of the new MacBooks is. Um, you're looking at uh, 800 to 1,000. No, yeah, 800 to 1,000, like a 960 Pro or a 970 Evo. Uh, you're looking at uh, you know 800 to 1,000 dollars for a two terabyte drive. So. Yeah. I don't know if I've even seen a four terabyte. I wonder if they have two NVMe slots or M.2 slots inside of there. Because, um, yeah, looking at like $800 for an NVMe drive. So either they're the only ones that have four terabyte NVMe's or they are doing something really interesting that almost justifies uh, the uh, unspeakable expense of that. <laughs> Um, I think Ken spec'd out the top level of this and it was like $6,700. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Hope. So, <laughs> you know, the other thing that, that I thought was interesting uh, is they also announced, um, I work with Blackmagic and they're doing <laughs> a, uh, I, I like to call it a toaster, uh, but uh, a, a Radeon Pro 580 external GPU with eight gigs of video memory, and that's going to sell for $700. Um, the Blackmagic E GPU, um, so uh, which also packs a couple of Thunderbolt ports, four USB 3 ports, an HDMI 2 port, um, supports Thunderbolt 3 displays, uh, should you have the coin uh, to pick up uh, one of those 5K LG monitors. Um, this is... Uh, this is good if you are a video editor, um, and it's actually available yeah. now. And I, you know, I, I, I you know, it's it does kind of look like a toaster in the sense of a Cylon. Um, you know, it's it's a classic. If you kind of click at the link, it's seven hundred dollars. It's only available from Apple, um, but it's got that sort of like air in through the bottom, out through the top. Uh, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, it's one of those but, things where it, it's. It's seven hundred dollars for right. an RX five eighty, which is not a it's not a five hundred dollar graphics card. It's not a four hundred dollar graphics card. It's probably more like a three hundred dollar graphics card. So you're paying, right. you know, for the Thunderbolt capability, the dock, the expansion. Like you do get a lot of kind of add-ons for it: the the USB, the Thunderbolt, the HDMI, right. um, the look, the style. Blackmagic stuff is an int it, Blackmagic's a great brand. We use a lot of their stuff here. It's yeah. it's a it's an in-between, I would call it. It's not like the highest end, most expensive video gear you can get, but it's also not cheap knockoff stuff that you're getting on Amazon from a third-party reseller that you're not actually sure if you're going to be able to get support or to get it to function, right? So yeah. they have, they have, they're in this perfect niche for them of where there's not a lot of competition in that market. They're doing a very good job there. This one, it seems it's a little bit odd to me, too, that it's Apple only. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there are just enough support issues with trying to get... You know, uh, external graphics cards working on Windows machines. When you might have RS3, you might have RS4. You have different Thunderbolt implementations right. on notebooks versus PCs. Whereas with the Mac, you just go, well, these four devices are supported. Boom, it's done. We we've limited our uh, our incoming phone calls by a dramatic <laughs> bit, right? So right, I'm sure that's well, a, a a part of it. If uh if you're kind of curious about whether or not you want to spend $700 for an external GPU, uh, I got to give props out to Puget Systems. They're a, a boutique, a, a small system integrator that, that uh, they, they don't have the most inexpensive systems because somebody pointed that out to me. They're like, well, you can get it cheaper. And I'm like, well, here's the thing. Puget Systems has uh, incredible support. And one of the things they do up there is they spend a lot of time actually testing um, and, uh, you know, I, I forwarded an article they did uh, recently where they were looking at a whole bunch of GPUs and how they actually, and w what they actually impact 
and how much they actually impact and whether your money yeah. is better spent on a processor or a GPU upgrade because there's a lot of there's a lot of mythology and there's a lot of rumors online about why you need this card or that card or this processor or the GPU will do this or it'll do that and the ra- the, the kind of radical slash frustrating uh, thing is there are you know, different things inside of different, uh, uh, you know, different features inside of Premiere are effective radically differently um, with uh, uh, with the GPU or the 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 CPU. And there's mm-hmm. no sort of there's no there's no like you know your GPU is going to accelerate everything. Well, kind of a faster GPU is going to be faster, but the reality is is it's not necessarily going to um, accelerate the thing you actually want. You know, and right. also, you know, they did a, a great, um, like, for example, uh, looking at export performance, they did export, uh, they benchmarked export performance between a GTX 1060, a 1070, a 1080, a 1080 Ti, a Titan XP, and a Titan V. Um, you know, and you're, you know, basically, if a 1080 was kind of the standard at 100%, a 1060, which is half the price, gave you 84.4% of the performance, uh, and a Titan V gave you 117% of the performance. So, you know, you could spend twice as much on a GPU, uh, but things are only getting about 17% faster. So mm. the the level of kind of benchmarking they're doing uh, to kind of figure out what a recommended system is, I just, I, I like what they're doing. I like to, to get people over to their websites to look at stuff. Um, it's pretty fascinating, uh, at least to me. I agree. Uh, because just, there's not that many people doing kind of content creation or post-production uh, testing. And uh, props to Puget for putting the effort in on that one. Agree. New Surface Go. Portable power, which I think is kind of a an oxymoron, a misleading title. Well, it's not an oxymoron. Well, maybe it is. Or the name of a, of a USB memory or a USB <laughs> battery that you take with you to keep your phone charged. Yeah. Well, and it's, which is incredibly uh, heavily searched if you look in Google Trends. I got an interesting uh, tweet about this one. And uh, uh, quote, don't you guys agree that four gigabytes of RAM is not enough for today's tasks? Um, uh, in, in the thing, when I was answering that tweet, I pointed out that almost every laptop manufacturer has like, that model and that model tends to be their thousand dollar or thirteen hundred dollar premium laptop for example i have very few qualms uh one of which probably the primary one being the location of the webcam on dell's xps 13 um Mm. but uh you know the sort of nostril cam at the side um but you know their entry-level model often is a four gigabyte model and HP does this and just about everybody does this where there's a four gigabyte model that's like really attractively priced and you don't want that if you're running Windows because Windows and four gigabytes sucks and more often than not you'll find that you can't actually upgrade that laptop because the you know memory is soldered on the motherboard um, so to be honest with you um, for me the four gigabytes of RAM which is problematic uh, but it's what everybody else does because you know, they're building to a price point three hundred ninety nine dollars okay. for four gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes uh, in an emmc program uh, EM, emmc format that kind of sucks for me the bigger issue is that you're not getting a keyboard unless you spend another ninety nine dollars um, right so this is also only running Windows 10 in S mode, which means you can only use apps from the Microsoft Store, which means I'm pretty sure you can only use Microsoft Edge, which is really not something I'm interested well, in dealing with. I mean, that's how it comes out of the box, but you can you can absolutely upgrade this out of S mode to Windows 10 Home full uh, for free <laughs> still. Okay. Um, so you still, have, you still have the capability to do that. And it's one of those, you know, th- they're trying to very gently push people towards S mode because of its security and, sure. and kind of cross platform compatibility that they're trying to ramp up, but that's just not really, that's not really what people wanted. Right. Uh, and I, what I still don't still think they will want uh, with that right. going forward. Um, I mean, if you want a tablet, four gigs buy of, an iPad. <laughs> well, th- that's what, that's what I was going to say. This, this, this is really, this is going against the iPad. Um, mm-hmm. It's a three ninety nine starting price, which is very. And I think the iPad starts at three seventy nine. Um, they're they're you know this doesn't come with a keyboard as you mentioned. Um, they're, they're, it's price competitive with the iPads as you go up the stack. 
Um, but the difference is obviously here you're running Windows, you're running a different app ecosystem, you get a keyboard, you have different kind of productivity expectations right. at this point. And I actually see there are, you know, you could you could use the mindset of the, the portable professional or the person who's doing a, a tablet consumption. I think if you're doing consumption only, probably an iPad still makes the most sense. But if you're um, if you're in education and I, I'm kind of of the mindset that iPads make the most sense for, um, let's say, up through elementary school, maybe mm -hmm. beginning of middle school. But as soon as you get into things where you have to start typing, you have to start writing reports, you have to start generating content um, for your school that a keyboard and Windows tends to make more sense, which is why Chromebooks you know, in, uh, are more like an operating system that we're used right. to than, than the iPad is. And I think that's really what Microsoft is kind of going after here. They're going to release an LTE model of this later in the year, apparently, as well, that that's more interesting to me as a mobile professional that mm -hmm. might be interested in this type of device. But then they made some hardware choices that don't really make sense. Um, they're using the Intel Pentium Gold processor, which is essentially an Atom design it's it's just what they what they've rebranded their their successive atom generations to and it's right. fine um and i'm sure i'm not positive of this but my guess would be internally at microsoft they sat there and they went mm, is the qualcomm snapdragon 835 ready for this uh or do we want to go back to one of the lower cost lower performance intel solutions and i think at the end they decided to go with the intel solution because of app compatibility uh, they didn't want to have questions about why some apps worked and some didn't with their inside their own surface line um but when you do that you lose the, the huge bet like this is only rated at nine hours of battery life those um uh, qualcomm ones are near 20. um so there there's a significant delta there and then you obviously Anything that would have a Qualcomm chip would have LTE connectivity or potential LTE connectivity, and this at its lowest prices is, is not. So they, they clearly made some trade-offs from a mm -hmm. hardware point of view in order to make sure they had the fewest question marks going forward, even though I think it was sacrificed a little bit on uh, right. on the capabilities of the of the unit. It's interesting when you when you look at some of the stats for educational sales in the United States. Um, Mobile, I don't have numbers for desktops, but when you look at mobile uh, hardware in the United States, like 57, 59% running through the end of Q4 um, is Chrome OS. Um, iOS is like maybe 10 to 15%. Uh, Mac OS is single digits, like sub 5%. And Windows is is in the sort of, you know, it, it vacillates from like 18 to 25%. Um, Windows is actually more popular in the rest of the world than it is in the U.S. in educational systems for mobile devices, uh, possibly because Chromebooks mm. just haven't penetrated as much. But uh, you know, it's it's uh, it, I, you know the, you're just starting to get a lot of the first of the sort of three hundred, four hundred dollar ish um, Windows devices, or or that they're starting to come out in volume. Um, I think it's you know it's it's a frustrating it's. I'm torn because there's a lot of things I like about the Surface Books um, and the Surface Pro, or I should say the Surface Pro especially, um, where it's this really nice, you know, as odd as the kind of three by two ish screens were, like that didn't really bother me so much long term. The you right. know, by the by the Surface Three, that magnetic keyboard is actually pretty functional and highly useful, um, you know. But if you spend more money, you don't necessarily get a lot of performance because they've stuck to their guns with having a passive cooling system, which actually destroyed. You know, a friend of mine had a you know what amounted to a three thousand uh, dollar you know Surface device that he couldn't actually do anything on because the thermals throttled the performance of the processor to the point that it mm -hmm. was considerably slower than a sub $1,500 laptop. And, uh, you know, so, you know, most people are going to buy that $549 version of this. I think for education, you know, I think Google's working incredibly hard to take what they've built and built on it. And a lot of that has to do with the administrative and backend tools and being able to lock down the environment. Um, right. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see what's going on, you know, in terms of like, you know, is four gigabyte of RAM not enough? Not particularly if you tend to run multiple applications simultaneously. Uh, I'm very curious to see what that EMC, EMMC memory 
or storage performance is like because it's certainly going to be slower than an SSD. Um, I think most people are going to go to the $549 system um, or they're going to be frustrated by that uh, $399 system. Um, you know, for me though, $500 with a keyboard is a lot of money for that. And I'd be pointing people towards a Chromebook uh, at that point. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, the other thing is, you know, the 1800 by 1200 uh, pixel sense monitor uh, at a whopping 217 pixels per inch um, probably won't be awful. Um, but compared to some of the other offerings out there, I think is going to be, uh, I think you will enjoy. <laughs> I, you know, I may be spoiled because I've, I've been working on an ultra wide monitor on my desktop. So, you know, it is in the neighborhood of 1920 by 1080, but I'd, I'd like a little more, a little more horizontal space on that one. So interesting. Yeah, interesting. I agree. Uh, I'll be curious what sales are, are like on that. I'll also be curious whether or not Apple bumps the per Apple, excuse me, Microsoft bumps the performance, uh, on the more high end surface devices. Um, because, you know, anybody who's doing any kind of power work, whether they're a programmer compiling or, or just running a ton of apps simultaneously, has to be incredibly frustrated uh, by the high-end Surface devices. Yeah. Um, in any case, I'm starting to mumble, so... Uh, <laughs> 2600E and 2700E, uh, those are the lower power Ryzen models. Uh, they just started uh, showing up online. Um, the Ryzen 5 2600E... It's looking like a really nice processor. You know, you're talking about six cords, twelve threads, uh, and uh, half gigahertz uh, base frequency. Uh, base frequency is a half gigahertz lower than the 2600X at 3.1 gigahertz. Uh, writes Jeremy Hellstrom, and the Ryzen 7 2700E, eight cores, sixteen threads, 1.1 gigahertz down uh, to a base of 2.8 gigahertz. Quote, sadly, the rumors did not reveal details about the boost clock. So for now, that remains pure speculation. Um, I thought it was, it, it, any, you know, do we assume that these details have been leaked by AMD to prepare people for the launch of the part? Or, uh, or is this just... <laughs> probably not. Or at least just to keep people from buying? <laughs> probably not. Uh, um, probably not. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it's It's still, I mean... These are the the low TDP parts. You're going to lose some frequency on it, but you know if if your goal is is quiet, efficient computing rather than just the 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 most performance you can get in that form factor, these are are going to be great. These are essentially better bend versions of the same silicon. There's nothing new or particularly different about what we're looking at here. Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly when we'll see them. Um, but it, if this much information is coming out, it's, it's going to be relatively quick, relatively soon. But we're, we are still kind of waiting for some of those to, to filter their way out still. Yeah, it was uh, the other interesting rumor that came out uh, also up at the Inquirer. Um, they're writing about Hong Kong site X Fastest, who got a hold on what they're saying is the Ryzen 5 2500X four core, eight thread, uh, 3.6 gigahertz base clock with a four gigahertz boost clock. Uh, I'm going to quote. Uh, uh, Lee Bell uh, over at the Inquirer who writes the I'm so sorry <laughs> X fastest only shared one bit of benchmark data about the Ryzen 5 2500X and that was that the chip overclocked to 4.3 gigahertz through XFR in Ryzen Master where it was able to garner a pretty mm. impressive 1066 point score in Cinebench R15 so they were running an X470 motherboard, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, and uh, the memory was clocked at 3,600 megahertz. So, I don't know. I'm just still excited about the Ryzen processors. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're it's interesting because I'm trying to think what the schedule was last year when we saw the 1800X, 1700X, and then we saw the 1600s and the 1500s. Uh, we saw 28s, 27s, and maybe 16s at the same time. And then we saw kind of the mid-range come out relatively soon afterwards. It's been a little bit longer delay this time. And I don't know if that's they're waiting for some inventory to clear in the channel of the older generation of this same price segment or not. Uh, but yeah, we are still missing some of that. We haven't seen the Ryzen Pro versions of the mm -hmm. like kind of like the workstation class versions of uh, the, the the Zen Plus architecture either. So we are still kind of waiting a little bit on that. And then obviously Threadripper 2000 series when we get to see our 32 core parts uh, 
here by the end of the summer, I, I'm pretty sure. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We should <laughs> uh, take a moment to thank our sponsor. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. Ring's mission to make neighborhoods safer. And the Ring Video Doorbell lets you see and speak to intruders on your smartphone from anywhere, even share video clips with neighbors using the Ring app. What's your favorite? At this point, you you have a Ring at home, a Ring Video Doorbell at home. You have a Ring Video Doorbell at the PC Per World International Headquarters. What's your favorite uh, incident involving the Ring Video Doorbell at this point, Mr. Shroud? I'm fortunate enough to say I don't have what I would call incidents. Um, <laughs> nobody trying to break into a house or an office that way. I think I've told the story before of catching the probably not 21 year olds drinking um, uh, uh, giant malt liquor cans in the parking lot of our office, for example, and scaring the bejesus out of them by talking to them uh, from the ring <laughs> that way. So that was fun. Except that I had to come in the next morning and clean up the cans that they left behind because they they left in a hurry, as you might have imagined. Uh, but it, <laughs> but it's good. It's good peace of mind to have either way. Oh my goodness! But you know what? You didn't have to go out there and confront them directly, which I think is a it's big true. plus. Yes. Uh, interesting story. Check this video out. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the, the 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 tweet straight here. A serial burglar was taken off the streets after she was spotted casing Clifford's home on Ring. Upon reporting the video to law enforcement, she was immediately identified as an individual with several prior alleged thefts and burglaries. That's up on Twitter.com/slash Ring. Um, they're working people. You may have to clean up the beer cans. You may have to call the cops, but uh, it's nice to know what's going on. Ring's floodlight, by the way, bringing light to the situation. Uh, the floodlight and spotlight cam lets you build a ring of security around your entire property. Look at that, people. Just like Ring's video doorbell, floodlight cam, motion-activated camera, and the floodlight that connects to your phone. With high visibility floodlights, HD video, and two-way audio, it lets you know the moment anyone steps onto your property. And as Ryan has attested, it's useful. You can see and speak to visitors. I think it's gracious visitors. Even set off an alarm right from your phone. When things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is. Is it teenagers with beer cans? Is it the neighbor's dog? You're going to know. Ring floodlight cams offer the ultimate in home security. Thieves just can't hide with Ring. Monitor every corner of your property with a Ring of Security kit, which includes a Ring video doorbell and your choice of either one, two, or three floodlight cams. And you can connect your Ring video doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience, monitoring, and security. Stop crime before it happens and make your neighborhood safer with Ring. Save up to $150 on a Ring of Security kit at ring.com slash twitch. That's ring.com slash twitch. Up to $150 off when you go to ring.com slash T-W-I-C-H. We want to thank Ring for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. It's exciting. It's exciting when people don't steal your stuff. I mean, uh... <laughs> Well, somebody stole something off my porch recently. Apparently, it's time for me to get a ring video. Oh. What's going on? Uh, <laughs> Jeremy's title on this, Captain Undervolt and the RX Vegas 64S. What's going on with uh, undervoltaging GPUs? So, I mean, this is, is this has kind of been something. It, it is. They're, they're, well, <laughs> probably. What do I know? Um <laughs> This is a thing that has been popular for a while. Uh, people do it with processors, main, main CPUs, and for GPUs. Although GPUs maybe have a more dramatic effect because the idea of undervolting is that you do exactly what that is. You, you run the GPU at a lower voltage and either attempt to maintain the same clocks at the lower voltage mm -hmm. or you're willing to lower clock speeds along with it. And the idea is if the GPU you have is, is running hotter or louder than you want um, or it's just, just drawing more power than you would like, you could, um, this kind of started with the, with the first Fiji parts where you could undervolt them and oftentimes get the same level of performance at 20% less power draw. Now, it seems nice. crazy that you would be able to do that and AMD wouldn't have been taking advantage of that to begin with. The problem is, is they're building their voltage curves and kind of their their systems around worst case scenarios and kind of where, right. the, where the range of binning is. So a lot of times they have to say, okay, we're going to, we could probably get away with 1.1 volts on 80% of the GPUs, but we need 1.2 volts to hit all 100% of the GPUs that we're going to sell. So we're going to put them all at 1.2 so we don't have to worry about it. 
Um, <laughs> that's the that's the best answer if you're AMD. But if you're a consumer and right. you like to tweak things, um, you know, a lot of people like to tweak up and go to overclocking, more voltage, more power, more noise, whatever. They don't really care. Or you go the other way down to to lower voltage, power, and uh, power draw because of it. Uh, he's... I was going to say, is this the future? But the reality is I think most of us are perfectly happy to make things louder. <laughs> yes. You know, outside of like, home theater and gaming. It's PCs, true. But it is. So, true. you know, but, but if you, the, the, the testing that overclockers club did is they, you know, they did three games. They saw, they saw, they said they saw a noticeable drop in power use when undervolting and not limiting the frame rate or using a, a high frame rate limit. This reduction in power use is important as it improves the efficiency of the Vega 64 and allows increased clock speeds with the reduction of thermal throttling. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting tweak there too, is they were able to see higher clock speeds on average with undervolting because the GPU wasn't running as hot and therefore it wasn't throttling as it would be. Now that, right. that seems more like a, a poor design decision or implementation decision by an OEM, a partner, um, mm -hmm. Uh, or or somebody that that maybe just said uh, I don't know these were the specs that they came out from the manufacturer for me right. dial it into the BIOS and let's move on as opposed to really spending time and tweaking. But to be fair, every piece of silicon is is going to behave a little bit differently and some drastically differently than others. And uh, I think you know the Vega parts are are they're great GPUs, but they they have some of the same kind of efficiency disadvantages compared to the GeForce parts that, that, that Fiji True. had as well. And so it kind of makes sense that this would all fall in line. It also makes me wonder, like, if you could get a more, yes, Homer, I feel you, uh, if you could get a more efficient cooler on there, would that afford you the opportunity to clock up higher because you could increase the voltage more at that point? But, yeah. you know... I mean, that's true. There, there, there's a ton of, of knobs to turn, knobs being voltage or cooling capability or uh, clock speed or what have you. And then they, they all affect each other. They're just like gears in a, in a clock type of thing. So y you've got to be careful one way or the other. But yes, a better cooler, like if you went to the extreme of LN2, now you've taken thermal throttling completely out of the picture, right? Um, right. It's not practical, but it is like the extreme case of it. So yeah, a better cooler... Um, as long as you're willing to deal with either the higher cost of the new cooler or the additional noise of the new cooler, will will change that that uh, algorithm quite a bit. Oh my goodness! If you've uh, been contemplating buying a new phone and the price of the flagships uh, frighten you, and they probably should, uh, if you're not looking at something like a One Plus Six, which is a fantastic phone for the money. Um, Shannon took a look this week on Tech Thing at the Motorola's uh, Moto G6. And the downside of this phone is, in the U.S., it's only available in the 3 gigabyte, 32 gigabyte model. Uh, if you're in the U.K., you can pick up the 6 gigabyte, 64 gigabyte model. And I only say that because I want more space to store uh, my songs, number one. And number two, I want to be able to do seven or eight months of photos uh, without... Uh, without removing them from the phone. But it, it'll do a 128 gigabyte uh, micro SD card. Um, I was shocked at how good this was. It's a $249.99 phone, 5.7-inch um, IPS LCD. It's a 1080p display, which is not as fabulous as some of the high-end displays, but this is a $250 phone. They are following a lot of the high-end phones, but doing an 18 by 9 the sort of longer, skinnier uh, phone layout mm. on that one. So it's, it's not quite as... Uh, it's not quite as retinal uh, as the more high-end phones, uh, but it's really, really nice and really, really thoughtful. For example, you can adjust the dimness down pretty much to nothing, which is something I really, really wish uh, iOS would allow me to do on my iPhone. Um, the, uh, you know, it's Gorilla Glass on the front and back. Uh, the Gorilla Glass back scares me. Um, Bluetooth 4.2, wireless, AppDex, uh, all are awesome things. USB-C, uh, which I think is a really smart choice, and it is uh, uh, including uh, inclusive. It includes a headphone jack, which makes me really, really happy. Um, 3,000 milliamp hour battery takes like an hour and 40 minutes to fully charge. Uh, I will let you uh, head over to techthing.com if you want to see uh, what the audio quality looks like. But I will tell you this. If you like to walk around uh, taking photos, this one, is the $250 phone. This one, I should say videos, this one is what the $1,000 phone looks like. Um, but not a bad looking camera. I was laughing because Shannon was like, eh, on the camera. And I was like, actually, that looks amazing. But she basically buys a new uh, flagship phone every six to eight months. And I'm running an iPhone yeah. 6. 
uh, that I've been yeah. running forever. Um, you know, comes with the Moto software, uh, uh, which is not pure Android, uh, but is essentially a Android 8.0 Oreo uh, with a little bit of extra thrown on top, but not enough that it's going to drive you completely insane. Um, you know, for me, I would immediately need to throw in a micro SD card into it, uh, or I would use up all the space with music, music, music. Um, <laughs> Snapdragon 450, uh, 1.8 gigahertz octa-core processor, um, and again, 3 gigs of RAM and 32 gigabytes of storage. I hate that they don't have more storage available, but I think they really want you to step up uh, and spend more money on a phone if you want more storage, at least in the United States, or just, you know, buy a freaking micro SD card. Um, you know, it's amazing. This this was a $1,000 thousand this was an eight <laughs> back uh, back when before flagships were a thousand dollars so this was an eight hundred dollar flagship phone two or three years ago uh it is now uh, outclassed by the thousand dollar phones but it costs a quarter of the price um yeah i was pretty impressed that that actually may be my next phone because the compass has died mm -hmm. my iphone 6 and the fact that i can't use the compass to move my uh <laughs> applications around my uh, astronomy applications around has been driving me more and more nuts over the last few weeks. Magic Leap, a company we've been covering for what seems like forever. Um, <laughs> most of which uh, almost entirely on the extraordinary hype their incredible valuation had generated. I still don't understand how they can possibly sell enough of their gadgets uh, to pay back the incredible amount of venture capital they've taken in. But we have a release date, kind of. AT&T and Magic Leap form exclusive U.S. consumer relationship to expand the future of spatial computing. This is like the breathiest PR announcement I've read in forever. A strategic, exclusive U.S. consumer relationship and investment with Magic Leap, developer of proprietary spatial computing and experimental, excuse me, experiential platforms. Um, Magic Leap is uh, not augmented. Uh, it is transformational technology. Um, you know, it's it's one of the breathiest press announcements I've ever read, which, um, given how long I've been reading these, is kind of terrifying to say out loud. But essentially, Magic Leap will be shipping this summer uh, their creator's edition. And... Uh, I'm I am really curious to see this. Uh, if for no reason, then I desperately, just for fun, want to see this live up to or exceed the incredibly breathy hype that's around it. Um, I would like to point out that summer actually started uh, a few weeks ago, <laughs> and they have until September. And I really, really hope they ship uh, NVIDIA Tegra X2 processor. It's going to be an AT&T yeah. only. Uh, as far as I can tell, there is no price which may mean that it is priceless. Um, but, uh, you know, I, you know, it's, <sighs> you know, I, it... so here, let me, let me give you my take on this. Um, <laughs> it's been four years. We've been treated to video after video of amazing footage, whether or not it was Tra real or not. Or, or, yeah, Transformative. You're correct. Uh, this that is was, no longer... Whether or not it was real or manufactured, yeah. unknown, probably mm -hmm. clearly based on the demo we saw that that is real. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> Technologically, it's not nearly as superior as it first seemed, which makes sense because it first seemed that way four years ago. And now we've yeah. moved on. We've got, you know, AR kit on Apple. We've got uh, Qualcomm's entry into AR and VR. We've got like even the damn Lenovo uh, Star Wars Jedi challenges thing, right? All of these yeah. um, have set the, the stage very differently for Magic Leap. Now, the demo that they showed, the one that was called Dodge, that is you point at a surface uh, and deem that a, a surface which a, from which a golem comes out of the ground. Right. And it's cool. It, it takes the texture of the ground and it rips it up. And then this golem comes up and he throws big rocks at you. And... The, as the name would imply for Dodge, which is the game, you can either swat the rocks away, which is cool <laughs> because your hand is interacting with something that's not really there, uh, right. or you can uh, like dodge out of the way and let it go behind you. And when you do that, the, the, the rock will hit the real life surface behind you and shatter in the virtual world, right? So it's, it's kind of interesting that that happens. You see, that's a bad example because it hit the guy in the face. They did not play the game Dodge very well. So there, there's the hand doing it. Uh, I think the, the next one, maybe they throw it over you. 
Um, but what you'll notice is like the graphics here are way less impressive than you know the the previous videos would show right. you. They, uh, it's a little bit juddery, like the tracking isn't perfect. This is probably more realistic to what you're actually going to see. Is it neat? Yes. Is it transformative? No. And no matter all the words they want to use about light fields and all this other kind of stuff, it's, it's, this is a known quantity now. And if nothing mm -hmm. else, they're, they're the leader in a small, in a well understood space. They're no longer a leader in a, in a mysterious place where they can, Right. Make stuff up and, and expect everybody to, to drag along. But on the bright side, they've put out a shipping date. They haven't announced or a shipping time frame. They haven't put out pricing. <laughs> so for me, this goes from a um, vaporware discussion to a it will it live up to the hype discussion, which is a which is a movement in the right direction for them. Right. They needed to prove that they could do something. Yeah. They have a lot of investors in this that have put a lot of money into the the magic that they that they claim that they'll be creating. So we'll see. It, you know, oh, part also, of me, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, part of me wonders, um, you know, part of me wonders just exactly how good this is because AT&T paid, I, I think they were like, they took a stake in Magic Leap to get the exclusive distribution deal. Um, you know, mm. this is, now, obviously AT&T has a lot of money to spend, right? Because, you know, they're, they're dropping $85 billion on Time Warner. They, they bought like AppNexus for $2 billion, um, you know, but this is, uh, this is, it's crazy. There's, you know, they've, they've taken in well in excess of a billion dollars at Magic Leap. So certainly a lot of people are buying into the hype here. They've, no, I'm sorry, they've, they've raised in excess of $2 billion at this point. Including money from Google, Alibaba. Um, I'm, I, I, this. It must be really transformative when you see the real demo because people keep cutting gigantic checks, um, and this is another gigantic check. And, <laughs> yeah, that's and, true. And you know what I mean? Like this is this is yet another gigantic check from. It, okay, AT and T is on kind of a spending spree right now, or maybe you know once you've dropped eighty five billion dollars, um, you know another half a billion or billion here and there doesn't feel like much. But there's a lot of money being pumped into this. Like this is you know two point three five billion dollars before whatever AT and T dropped into it. And AT and T's not even talking about like, hey, we're gonna have a super cool device for the holiday shopping season. They're just talking about having something targeted towards developers, which hopefully is targeted towards developers at the sort of Oculus end of the scale and not at the uh, Microsoft end of the scale. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I we've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> we will wait. Hopefully by September, uh, they actually September have something. September 22nd. That, well, that is the end of the summer. That is the last That's possible the end of the day summer. for a summer release. <laughs> Man, and I thought oh, I was oh, goodness. Uh, well, yeah. I just hope they I hope they actually release it this summer. Uh, and I hope it's not at a price that makes people, you know, immediately go if, like, are you insane? <laughs> if you thought you looked odd with a VR headset on, like... That I think these look even more weird. And what's worse is you can see people looking at you weirdly as well. Yeah. Whereas before you put on a VR headset, you can just assume that they're not there. You just you know close your eyes. Doesn't matter type of deal. You don't have that. You don't have that capability with the magic leap. So, well, oh well, we we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, because it's never too early for rumors. Uh, you know, we'll just end on the. Uh, while we're speculating on the eventual existence of a Magic Leap product, um, there are uh, TF International Securities, uh, Ming-Chi Kuo, uh, has his latest round, he or her, um, latest round of speculation uh, on new Apple products. 11-inch iPad Pro, a Mac Mini update, 1.57 and 1.78-inch Apple Watches, and Air Power coming in the fall. So... His predictions, my apology. Um, yeah, bigger bezel sizes on the Apple Watch may be the most interesting one on that list. Um, but uh, I'll be very, very curious to see uh, what Apple comes up with and what the next generation iPhone looks like. So I'm also hoping that the next generation AirPods that are being speculated on in this actually sound better. So, yeah, I would be okay with that. Yep. Can I get the wireless charger now? <laughs> Come on. Apple going wireless charging just as wireless charging loses momentum. Sounds about right.
<laughs> on that bright and cheerful and slightly obnoxious note, uh, PC per anything, uh, any, I, I, I feel like there are going to be no more GPU and no more CPU announcements. Sure. Okay. We're going to have the, the, the entry level AMDs or the less expensive AMD Ryzen and stuff, right? One yeah. would hope given the giant flood of 2,500 X, 2,600, 2,700 news. We talked about this week. Uh, Intel, seems to be spinning its wheels in terms of processor and introductions, uh, or maybe you've had a briefing that I haven't. Um, NVIDIA, I don't think there's any reason for them to drop a new GPU right now. AMD's kind of finally filling their pipeline. Um, you know, should we just stop talking about hardware news for the rest of the summer and just wait for the magic leap no. to show up? <laughs> no, I mean, like, look, we we know Threadripper 2 is coming. Threadripper 2000 series is coming this summer. We know... Um, it seems damn likely at this point that NVIDIA is going to have GPUs out sometime at the end of the summer. Uh, AMD won't have anything. They just have, they have never shown anything on the robot that makes us believe that. So there's, there's still a lot of stuff coming. Um, I would say for people who, who want to read about tech that in, in hardware that we're interested in, we, we posted that G-Sync HDR, uh, monitor review, the Asus P, I don't know, PG27Q. I can't remember what the name model number it was, but you'll know what it is. Uh, there you go, PG27UQ. Um, still the thing that, that you know, when we come into the office every day is, is impressing us a little bit each time. There is a bug we found where um, if you run it at a non-4K resolution, if you run it at 1080p, you can't go full screen in it. It, it tiles in the, uh, in the middle of the screen. That's apparently a driver issue that they're going to fix. Um, so if you had a... If you didn't have a Titan XP or a 1080 Ti and you didn't want to play at 4K, you wanted to play at 1080p with HDR enabled, you couldn't without playing on a very tiny, tiny, tiny window. So they'll they'll get that fixed, and then you'll we'll we'll see how uh, if HDR is affected in any way that way. We also took I don't know if Ken posted on the website or not, but we posted a some some teardown another teardown picture of the back of that display that shows the um, the the detail of the 384 zone backlight. I think he just posted it on Twitter. So yeah, he won't be able to find it right now. Uh, it's an impressive array of yeah. hardware to get that running. Uh, Cause basically each led zone has to have its own power delivery system. So there's 384 of that inside the monitor. You start to, when you start to dissect more of it, you start to go, Oh, yeah, there it is. You start to go, Oh yeah, no, this is an expensive monitor, isn't it? So all those, Little MOSFETs you see, that's that's only one half. That's only 196. No, hold on. 384 divided by two. Um, uh, it's only half of the array there. So it's it's neat. It's neat stuff. I don't recommend anybody else take apart a $2,000 monitor, but no. now you can see pictures of it at least. Yeah. Well, it, one of the questions uh, we used to get a lot on HD Nation, and, and we don't get so much anymore, either because reliability on monitors have, has increased or, or B, people have gotten the messages. We had a lot of questions back in the day, like, how can I replace the broken screen on my HD TV? And the answer is almost invariably, you can't. Not so much because it's that difficult, mm. although it is a... There are worse things. Um, it isn't a wicked ripping pain in the ass, for example, to unglue a glued on uh, screen on a laptop. Um, but it is almost impossible to get. You basically have to buy another television to strip out the parts you need to fix the television you have. Mm. And uh, it is it is a nightmare. Uh, and as you look at the inside of that monitor, you start to realize, like, imagine having to deal with all those connectors. And if you get just one of them backwards... You're not gonna. You have to pull the entire thing apart again and <laughs> and and root your way through them. So, I don't know. I it's it yeah. seems like an absolutely fantastic monitor, but for two thousand dollars, it delete expletive better be a fantastic monitor. So, mm -hmm. as money rained from the sky. With that, ladies Great. and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this week in computer hardware. We do Twitch weekly each and every week. Ryan Trout and I, we try to bring you well hardware news mobile, portable, console, laptop, and apparently even the occasional wearable device. I forgot to tell you about the tap wearable keyboard, which enables one-handed typing. I will do that next week. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will be here next week. So do us a favor, check it out. You can find, uh, well, you're looking at right now, if you got the video, twitch.tv slash T-W-I-C-H. You can find more of Ryan Trout, at Ryan Trout on Twitter at PC Per. You can find more of me at Patrick Norton. That's the best way to contact us, by the way, by our Twitter handles, if you will. And uh, we thank you for listening uh, to uh, This Week in Computer Hardware. With that, ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>